most times people learn music off a of staff, they're reading off a sheet, yeah. right? It tells you where the beats are, where the breaks are, everything like that. We learn by one of the arrangers calling the notes to us. They will play it and depending on your skill, you might be able to pick out what they're playing because also you'll know relatively what key you're playing in, whatever song you're playing yeah. in. Otherwise, if you're not picking it up just through ear, they're going to audibly tell you the notes. I'm going to play C, G, D, and then you're going to do that. The way that we learn the music and interpret it is also very niche in itself. And I think that that's something to be valued. And I really want people to come and see what that process looks like. Yeah. Um, because it's so different. Yeah. Like some steel bands do take notes off the staff. Personally, I'm so sorry, guys. Not for me, baby. Not for me. I think the best way to learn pen is audibly yeah. through ear or calling the notes. You're able to replicate it better because when you become dependent on the staff, just just for a steel pen you lose some of the feel the you essence. lose the essence the zest the zeal that mm -hmm. you get from it the vibes literally the vibrations from the steel that you feel mm. I feel like you become clouded when you're focused on reading something you're not opening the rest of your senses up right versus if I'm there I'm present and someone's calling the notes or they're playing and I can hear it I'm really tapping in and tuning into the instrument so I think that is the most special thing about seeing people learn pen and hearing it come together and hearing it get kind of rocky and then you're hearing all the different pieces you're hearing the bass you're hearing the guitar you're hearing the rhythm section going which for those who don't know rhythm is a set of percussion from the standard drum kit to a bongo to a uh, shack shack to an afuchi to a tambourine to a talk talk so those all also accompany the steel pen in the band okay and they also have to go through the learning process of knowing the stops knowing the counts keeping the tempo keeping the rhythm so it's a lot of pieces woven together that make the fabric of steel pen and anyone who comes to the pen yard i think you get hooked into that welcome back to another episode of in we blood the podcast that's dedicated to help reignite an appreciation for caribbean culture and traditions today i'm here with aldine who has been playing pan for 22 years is the marketing director of new dimension steel orchestra here in toronto Thank you so much for being here with me today, first thank of all. Thank you so much for having me, Kiana. Yeah. I'm honored to touch the In We Both podcast. <laughs> Yay! Thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's a community hub, honestly. And I really encourage anyone who has like any recommendations of people that I should be talking to, even if you have any recommendations when we're done, because... I want this to feel like a community thing and something where people feel like, oh, yeah, like I know I can go and talk to Kiana about that on mm -hmm. In We Blood. But yeah, tell Love me that. a little bit about how you got involved in Pan, because based on the math that I'm doing, you would have started at like seven yeah. or eight years old. Yeah. So I actually started playing at eight. OK. And I was a Pan baby. So both my parents actually met in Pan Fantasy playing Pan. And then as a result, when we moved to Scarborough, we moved to New Dimensions Steel Orchestra and just being in the pan yard all the time, feeling the vibes, seeing the positive influence and seeing even friends my age come around the pan yard, but not take interest in pan yet, mm -hmm. really started to get me like excited. And then when I was seven, <laughs> I used to just like tap on the different pens and stuff and kind of shadow people. When I was eight, I said, no, 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 we're starting right now. We're yeah. doing this this year. And then and, I jumped right into it. And you said that both of your parents played Pan and that they yeah. met playing Pan. Yep. So can you tell me like a little bit about like, I don't know, like I guess a little bit more about your parents' influence on you playing Pan. Obviously they had you around the Pan yards and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I kind of want to talk a little bit more about that impact because I think sometimes we don't realize, um, like I have a son now, mm -hmm. but I think sometimes we don't realize the importance of like being intentional on passing down culture so if Absolutely. you could kind of speak to your experience of your parents passing down that culture to you yeah um so again my parents were both playing in pen fantasy they had met each other and just kind of hit it off from there and once i was born i was born fully immersed in the band so going to practice was something regular um growing up with a lot of adults and uncle and aunt figures in the band was just something that happened also having uh, family friends that have become lifelong family through Penn was something that was just amazing being around everyone and having other like friends my age whose parents played Penn made it relatable because when I got older outside of school it was hard to make friends as a kid but having a foundation and a network in the Penn community was amazing so once I actually started playing Penn I realized how much my parents had influenced me and impacted me because I was so interested in just doing what they were doing mm -hmm. like mommy and dad are in the pan yard they're practicing they're having fun with their friends they're liming i'm seeing them work i'm seeing the payoff right so for myself i always knew i wanted to get into it and i realized i had a musical inclination young 
So it just motivated me to jump into it. And then once I started making friends in Penn, it was a even more of a reinforcement to stay in it. Yeah. And it was nice having friends in school and friends outside of school. Because when you're in elementary school, unless you're doing like a rep sport or your parents have you in something, where you're not really meeting friends that aren't your family members. Mm-hmm. So it was nice also me building separate networks outside of school and realizing that very early on, like this is something I'm passionate about. I need to dedicate time to this the same way I dedicate time to my homework and things like that. And it just literally fell in love with it. Yeah. And you yeah. haven't stopped since eight I years haven't old. Stopped. Have not stopped, baby girl. Listen, the only thing that stopped me was COVID. And that was so hard. Yeah. That was so hard. So not you being couldn't able to play, play Pan for like how long? I think it was like a year. I feel like I could be wrong. I know someone's probably going to check me. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but we took some time off, but we didn't actually compete because there was no Pan Alive. So we were still meeting up as a band. I think we had a one, two gigs, but there wasn't anything as concrete as what we're used to. So that structure change, I think, really enforced to us like, OK, I know there were summers that I complained about being in the pan yard. I know there was times I said I spent a lot of time here, but now not having access to it. Look how much I'm missing it. Look how it's affecting me. Yeah. That year really solidified like I cannot walk away from this. Mm. It's ingrained in me. It's literally in we blood like it's, it's mm-hmm. ingrained fully. And I think that was also a beautiful moment and a beautiful transcendence for a lot of us in the band because it really solidified that unity. Like, no, we're here. So Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so amazing to hear. Yeah. (laughs) Is in all your blood. For Uh, real. For real. (laughs) And I think it's so interesting how different aspects of the culture for different people, like, it just resonates with us. And it's just, like, activated in our DNA. It's like both of your parents played Pan. Mm -hmm. There was only so many options you had. (laughs) exactly exactly (laughs) so i think it's really cool how much i guess it's resonated with you and we are talking about you being younger and having front friends in the band and stuff like that and kind of building a community around that Mm -hmm. do you still see like younger kids participating in pan or what does it look like today so i think the landscape has changed a little bit i think part of it is also the age that i'm at now so i'm 30 so a lot of my peers are either just my age or like plus or minus five years within that range between 25 to 35, let's say. And I think a lot of us either don't have kids or are thinking about starting families. And I'm kind of seeing the impact of that now where there's less younger kids coming into Penn because we were the younger kids. So if we're not the ones having kids, um, I guess we're looking at like, you know, older people in the community to see if they have grandkids or anything to expand that network to reach out to them. Because I've just noticed personally in our band, there's less younger kids. Mm-hmm. But the players or supporters who do have kids, we encourage them to come to the pan yard. Like, you may take an inkling, your kid may take an inkling, you might just enjoy the vibes. And reaching younger audiences is definitely a priority because a lot of us started playing pan young. Not that you can't start when you're older. We've had a lot of esteemed players like Richard Cornelius, shout outs to you, Rich, who's one of the arrangers in New Dimension. He started playing in high school. So also it, it, it knows no age. It really just knows passion and intention. But I think it's very helpful getting kids when they're young and just ingraining uh, the culture into them, instilling that sense of pride and that discipline. It's a lot of sacrifice and discipline to play any instrument. But I think definitely reaching the younger kids is what we're focusing on. So like we've been doing a lot more workshops, doing a lot more things in schools, different school boards between Peel, TDSB and Toronto Catholic District School Board really trying to reach the kids and it's amazing seeing how much they soak it up and how excited they get about it but yeah i think children are like very special and i think it's important for us to have them actively engaged in the culture Mm -hmm. because like you said you don't know what they're going to take to what they're going to have an inkling for right so yeah i know when i was watching you guys perform at the media launch that it's like there's different aspects of pan. Mm-hmm. There's like some like base looking. Like, can you kind of yeah. explain a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. OK, so we're basically going through the anatomy of the steel pan. So yeah. we have a six base, which is made from the 55 gallon oil drums. So there's six bases. There's also a nine base, which has just as the name implies, it's very literal for the most part. Um, so there is nine base. There is f- tenor base, which has four bases. There is tenor pen, which is the steel pen most people are familiar with. That's the single individual that you may see on a stand or around someone's neck. There is seconds or alto, which is two pens that have like a deeper belly. There is double tenor, which is two pens that function the same as the singular tenor and they play melody. There is guitar, which is two pens with a longer skirt. They're used for strumming, just like a guitar in any other instance. 
Um, there's also three pen, which is a middle plan, a middle pen, which plays chords. There is four pen. There is rocket pen. I'm definitely missing some, but I think that's pretty much like the basis that you'll see in an ensemble, maybe minus rocket or all those, uh, oh, quattro. Yeah. Or quads, excuse me. Quads. Um, yeah. There's a lot of different types of I didn't pen. know there was so many types. Yeah. So every time I hear pan, when I hear, like you said, an ensemble, I'm always like, this is just the sweetest sound ever. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like when I'm in Grenada, there's a, like a, what would you call it? A steel pan orchestra? A uh, steel band, steel orchestra. Okay, a steel band. There's a steel <laughs> band. <laughs> there's a steel band that, that plays and I can hear them when I'm in town. And sometimes I would stand up outside like where their window is and just mm -hmm. stand up there and listen to them because it's so like mellifluous that's the word the or something that's sweet sounding but it's yeah. like so like captivating mm -hmm. and i've never actually been to a pan yard but recently okay. i was watching yeah i was watching some um like uh, of the competition like semifinals and stuff in trinidad yeah. and i was like this is so incredible it's my amazing. favorite thing is to see the youth playing like it makes yeah. me feel a little bit emotional too because i don't yeah. know i don't know what it is first of all i cry easy but <laughs> like it just makes me feel so emotional like seeing again that like childlike innocence and that excitement mm -hmm. and the passion for pan like mm -hmm. you're talking about i remember i was speaking to somebody and she said she spent a lot of time from she's from ghana she said she spent a lot of time in that pan yard in trinidad because she wanted to learn more about the culture and she said she learned so much yeah so i want to ask you like when people come to the pan yard and this might be like a silly question but like what is like what can we learn when we come and experience it like just mm -hmm. by watching no that's a great question um so when you come to the pan yard you're going to see us rehearsing and you might see a few things you might see us rehearsing as a full ensemble where we're going through a specific part um you might see us drilling a certain part so just like drill sergeants where we're going over something and you're getting in the repetitions to get accustomed to it. Or you could see us liming, talking nonsense, having a good time. But somewhere between the three of those is what you'll see us doing on an average night in the pan yard. And I think the thing that's beautiful that I kind of underestimate because I'm embedded in it, but people are making me aware of it, is the process of how we learn music yeah. is so specific to steel pen. Other instruments, you don't really learn that way in a group setting. So maybe for other esteemed musicians who may be pianists or play guitar, someone can call out notes to them and they can play it and they can hear the cadence and understand the phrasing. Most times people learn music off a of staff, they're reading off a sheet, yeah. right? It tells you where the beats are, where the breaks are, everything like that. We learn by one of the arrangers calling the notes to us. They will play it and depending on your skill, you might be able to pick out what they're playing because also you'll know relatively what key you're playing in, whatever song you're playing yeah. in. Otherwise, if you're not picking it up just through ear, they're going to audibly tell you the notes. I'm going to play C, G, D, and then you're going to do that. So the way that we learn the music and interpret it is also very niche in itself. And I think that that's something to be valued. And I really want people to come and see what that process looks like. Yeah. Um, because it's so different. Yeah. Like some steel bands do take um, notes off the staff. Personally, I'm so sorry, guys. Not for me, baby. Not for me. I think the best way to learn pen is audibly. Okay. through ear or calling the notes you're able to replicate it better because when you become dependent on the staff just just for a steel pen you lose some of the feel the you essence. lose the essence the zest the zeal that mm -hmm. you get from it the vibes literally the vibrations from the steel that you feel mm. i feel like you become clouded when you're focused on reading something you're not opening the rest of your senses up right versus if i'm there i'm present and someone's calling the notes or they're playing it and i can hear it i'm really tapping in and tuning into the instrument so I think that is the most special thing about seeing people learn pen and hearing it come together and hearing it get kind of rocky. And then you're hearing all the different pieces. You're hearing the bass, you're hearing the guitar, you're hearing the rhythm section going, which for those who don't know, rhythm is a set of percussion from the standard drum kit to a bongo, to a uh, shack shack, to an afuchi, to a tambourine to a talk talk so those all also accompany the steel pen in the band okay and they also have to go through the learning process of knowing the stops knowing the counts keeping the tempo keeping the rhythm so it's a lot of pieces woven together that make the fabric of steel pen and anyone who comes to the pan yard 
I think <laughs> you get hooked into that. You get hooked into watching I'm it. I'm getting hooked just thinking about and it. It's a vibe. It's a fun. We're, we're, we're there to have fun. We are there to learn. We are there to engage. The camaraderie is amazing. We're there to grow as musicians and individually. But also the times where you get to just lime and chill is unmatched. Mm. Those are the best times Especially of the summer. Especially after all the hard work. What? And we're under a bridge, by the way. Located at York Mills and Leslie. Conveniently under the bridge near the LCBO if you're in the area. So we are covered. Rain or shine. People can come to our pan yard. It's raining outside. No problem. You pull up a chair and you're just in the vibes. Okay. Watching us play pan. So it's. So when is like the pan season? Because mm-hmm. are you guys out there in the winter? So we are not. So in the winter, we do practice in the indoor space, which we've been afforded right now, which we're super grateful for. Um, But in the summer months, so from about June is when we begin practicing outside until the end of August, September. And when does Pan Alive happen? Is that our equivalent of Panorama? Yeah. So the Ontario Steel Pan Association or OSA holds Pan Alive, which is the Friday before Caravana. And it's always at Allen Lamport Stadium. So this year that would be Friday, Friday, August 3rd, excuse me, at Lamport Stadium. So the same place where King and Queen is. Same place where King and Queen is. So King and Queen is on the Thursday. Panalive is on the Friday. For anyone who wanted something to do on the Friday other than going to a FET, that is a great addition. And that's what we're trying to encourage in our generation too, especially for like the younger parents. Like you yourself are a parent. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want to go out the Friday night, but you want to do something with your son. This is something else you can do. You know what I mean? Come in and take in Pan and it's the same venue you're familiar with for King and Queen, but it's just yeah. a different vibe. And like I was saying to somebody yesterday, the whole reason why I started my podcast is because, my okay, so I'm second generation Canadian. My parents mm-hmm. were born here, but mm-hmm. my grandmother is the one who kept me connected to the culture. Nice. Now that I have my own child, I started thinking to myself, like, I know some about our culture, but mm-hmm. I don't feel like I know enough mm-hmm. to pass on to him. Mm-hmm. And so In We Blood was just like, these different questions that I've had that I've wanted answered and that I wanted to learn more about. And I figured that a lot of my peers also don't have these answers or don't have this understanding. So as I have conversations with people like yourself who are experts in different areas of the culture to share that with everybody. Right. And it's really just for me to be able to pass this on to my son. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, you want to learn about pan watch episode whatever from however many years ago. Right. And so I think you telling me that now is getting me excited because it's like, oh, on the Friday night, like I have a cultural event that I know I can bring him to and that he'll have fun and that he'll enjoy. Pan is something that you literally feel feel like Mm -hmm. and and Mm -hmm. i know i said this about voices song um cheers to life how it gives me tingles but like when i hear pan there's just something about it and i say this about different instruments particularly different drum patterns where it's like Mm -hmm. a dna activation just happens absolutely it's like genetic like it's just something where it's like like it's like it's like a remembrance you know what i mean and like pan has this almost like hypnotic effect on me where it's just like oh my gosh like it's so sweet and it's so funny me and my cousins would joke sometimes where i remember when we were younger like people tripping behind the pan truck that was like an old people thing but we're saying now like yo that pan truck does be real freaking sweet what I miss playing pan on the road here. Yeah. Honestly, I used not to even, love that. Not even just here, but like anywhere. Like, yeah. like it's so, it's, and I'm sorry that I cut you off. No, I no, completely, please. but it's like, it's such a nice experience mm. and it's good to hear that for you guys too. Like you're having fun on there and you're not, you know, reading off the staff. Like, yeah. <laughs> five, six, seven. I don't know how music you know counts I mean? go, but <laughs> <laughs> it takes away some of the essence for sure. And again, no knock, no diss. Don't come for me. You know what I mean? But if the shoe fits, you know what I'm saying? Because until you realize the real essence, when you're going to these pan yards in Trinidad, you think they have staff set up, mm. set up, you think they have, notes written down on the musical stuff no someone saying baggy daggy da bram 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 and telling you the key oh, that you're in okay. you're going from there someone is telling you c d e b f g and you're gonna play it back that's how you learn it oh my god and the God. faster you pick it up the it's better. like a language absolutely there's absolutely. no there's when we're learning a language there's no like the way that we learn language in school is so silly because mm-hmm. that's not how we learn language in life exactly so it's like almost learning like learning the language of pan absolutely the real way that you would learn any other language absolutely yeah absolutely and i think that's like probably the the biggest thing that when i see pan replicated that like kind of bothers me because those players I find it limits the settings in which they're able to grow because they're dependent now on having that musical notation already formulated for them, which also means the arranger would already have everything laid out, which also means they're not being inspired by things that they're hearing 
as they're arranging. Well, so what's the role of the arranger? Yeah, so the arranger is essentially the lead musician in the band who takes a piece of music and extrapolates and interpolates. So they'll take a song and for the for the panel live competition here in Toronto, there are two pieces that you play. So the main competition song is what gets judged, which is a calypso, so it has to be like a soca or calypso. Then the bomb tune is a pop song, so anything not uh, soca or calypso genre. So typically, the arranger will arrange a soca song, let's say DNA by Mikhail Teja, and then make that three minute song into an eight minute arrangement. Oh. So within that song, they've extrapolated, they've built onto it, they've brought in their own motifs, they use their own inspiration to really turn the song into something else. So they are highly skilled musicians that should be absolutely revered for what they do in the mm -hmm. scope of pen because arrangers are the ones that are really really pushing pen they're the ones that are changing the landscape making it visible because of the soundscape that they're providing right so the arranger is the one who says here's a song that i have boom i'm gonna make it into eight minutes and here's what i've come up with in this eight minutes to represent this song so when you're used to learning music that's already written out for you it doesn't give the arranger that time to be inspired you know, so sometimes like in my past experience, I've worked with amazing arrangers in New Dimensions, such as Darren Shepard, who's also my godfather. Shout out to Sheffy and Fong Claire in Trinidad, uh, Andre Rouse, who leads Souls, uh, so -so, Souls of Steel Orchestra. Um, currently, Terrell Wilson, Denise Owls, Richard Cornelius, my dogs, you already know. And just working under different arrangers and hearing their different styles. If they had that music solidified beforehand, that feel wouldn't be there. That vibe wouldn't be there. You wouldn't they get their true essence. They figure it out right there with you. They figure it out with you. They might come beforehand with a, a layout of it and a shell, but they might fill it in. You might play something wrong and they might be like, wait a minute, that actually sounds good. Let me add a harmony to it. Mm. So that's why I'm so anti like learning steel pen off a staff and office sheet you lose so much of the essence because there's like an energy that happens oh i have tingles sorry i always talk about when something gives me tingles but it's like there's an essence that happens where mm -hmm. everybody's energy comes together it in comes the pan yard yeah and you miss that you you erase some of that because what could happen is say you have something already premeditated yeah. all the pieces you already have figured out when you get to the pan yard and you get inspired now now i have to go back and rework all the other pieces because everything meshed together in that moment but now if I'm inspired by something else, which often happens with artists, now they have to change. So do you want to go in with a foundation, but still okay. give yourself room to be inspired? That's what and I was going to gonna move. ask next. Yeah. So I was going to say, so what do you come to the pan yard with? So they come in with a foundation. So like when you're starting a song, let's say, again, the bomb tune in he uh, here is eight minutes long. So last year we played Engine Room. Engine Room already gives you like verse, chorus, hook. So we already know how Engine Room sounds. I was saying why I'm so anti like... Um, Staff sheet music. Yeah, learning on sheet music. It, you lose the essence. And not only from the... Not only do I think it can hinder the arranger, but I also think as an actual musician it puts you at a disadvantage in the pen scope any other realm <laughs> you reading music off the staff is an absolute advantage as a musician in the steel pen world because when someone calls to you the notes you might be discombobulated you know what to do you're used to seeing it and getting that directive so i think a huge essence and something that needs to be preserved in the pen yard is the art of teaching pen the art of receiving notes Wow, yeah. I, that's actually a really good point because yeah, like people who come from traditional music backgrounds, I guess they're probably so shocked in the beginning. Like, <laughs> yeah. what is happening right now? Like, yeah. what, we're just going off vibes. Yeah, and that's exactly what you feel as a listener. You feel that vibes that you guys are going off of and creating, and it's like, oh my gosh! Like every time, it's so captivating to me. It's just yeah. like because it's just this. Now that I have more context into like how the music is created, it's literally like everybody's energy just coming mm -hmm. together to like form these beautiful symphony. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's so incredible and it's so crazy the way I mean, now I'm going to get into like, I guess my my academies or whatever the heck you call it. But it's mm -hmm. like the way how certain like eurocentric standards of like rightness that part and it's like well it's not on a staff sheet and you guys don't have a conductor and it's like but there's all these elements that are still present but mm -hmm. it just shows up in a different way mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit absolutely firstly the steel pen was the only instrument created in the 20th century so let's start there and people always big up that that fact because 
it is so crucial to also realize how young the instrument is and how much impact it's had in its short lifespan. Um, speaking on the Eurocentric views and how those things have affected, I think, the view of Steel Pen. Definitely you can see when Steel Pen is commercialized, for instance, Little Mermaid, a lot of people, it's probably the first time they heard Steel Pen on a track. I mean, under the sea. Da -ba -da -bum -bum -ba -dum -bum -bum. That was a lot of people's first foray into hearing Pen. When we watched the movie, for instance, at the premiere, we were laughing and so upset with the representation of how it even physically looked. We're like, those are the wrong sticks. That pen is not a pen you would see someone actually playing for what they were doing. So when you see it also being watered down, it's like in one way you guys recognize the benefit and the beauty of it. And then in one way, it's kind of being like almost to say bastardized. You're, you're, you're watering it down and it's degrading it. And we were just shocked because we're like, who did you guys consult? You guys could have easily consulted someone because there's no way someone's playing guitar with a wrong type of pick. So how could you show someone playing steel pen with the wrong type of stick? Hmm. So I definitely see that there is a way that pen has become watered down in a sense, not from the actual people playing pen. I also want to make that clear from the people who are perceiving pen because the people who actively play pen understand what it is and what it's not. And something like reading off a staff is something I think that some people may think is a part of pen and I know it not to be. All the best people I know that play pen, they have a musical basis. And I also want to make that very clear. They're all very musically competent. They all are very well versed in music theory. But how they learn steel pen music is not in the same traditional way that you may another instrument. But it doesn't mean that they don't have those skills and capabilities to translate to other instruments. Most steel penists can play multiple instruments, right? So I can see how in some ways it becomes like a narrowed focus and that's really why we're trying to break those stereotypes, break the mold, show people how we actually learn music. How do we actually practice? How do I actually take it in? What does that actually look like when I'm playing it? You know what I mean? These are the sticks I use. What is the significance of this? Why do I use this kind of stand? Why don't I use a musical staff? You know, even things like the instrument itself is sensitive. It's heat sensitive and it's water sensitive. So it can't get too hot, it can't get too cold. So when people aren't understanding, when people are trying to book us for gigs, for instance, and they wanna have us outside with no tent, and we say no, baby, this is why. The pen cannot be in the heat, it will damage it. The same way you would never suggest that a pianist plays the piano in the rain, right? So these are the things also that we are really trying to implement and make people aware of and respect of how delicate this is, how strong this instrument is, how powerful it is, how the craftsmanship and the time that's taken into this makes it so valuable. You know what I mean? And really, really try to assert that with people. And every workshop we go to and every time we're like teaching lessons, that's one of the basis we start with, how a pen is made, how to care for a pen. So when you understand how to care for a pen, I think it also adds a level of understanding to it that makes people appreciate it more. Yeah. People know you can't pull a guitar string and just keep plinging, plinging it. People know you have to tune it, right? Mm. Same thing with a, a drum kit, for instance. You got to tighten the skins on your conga, right? But people don't know how do you upkeep a pen? Mm -hmm. What do how you do? How do you upkeep a pen? So you get someone to tune it and blend it. So they would essentially use a hammer and like a, a device where they can measure the the decibels and or the actual pitch so they know that it's in tune and they will hammer it and listen to it and hammer and hammer it and then use their acute skills and their amazing uh, musician musicianship to hear that it's the right note and then realize okay I, t I took the note where it needs to be because when you hear a pen out of tune you know mm. you know so again even that the, the craftsmanship in it not everyone can tune their pen most people cannot yeah. tune their pen. It's a very disproportionate ratio to people who can make pen and tune it to people who can play it, which also increases the value of it. Yeah. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. That's so cool to hear. It's like yeah. when you're like when a piano needs tuning, like you need to call somebody in. Right. To, exactly. But Absolutely. when a guitar needs tuning, you can just do that. You yourself. can just do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. When a pen needs tuning, you need to call someone that, you know, someone that you trust that can tune and bend the pens to make all the pens also in your bound sound cohesive. So your tone sounds the same. What do you mean by blend? That's again to make so, the sound cohesive? Yes, exactly. So okay. like you can also tune the pen, but sometimes the note doesn't need to be retuned. It just needs to be blended. So you might just need to hit it. And when you're physically hitting the pen, you're creating different dents in it and then that's changing the frequency and the pitch. Mm. So sometimes they just need to go and adjust it. So maybe your sound is sounding kind of flat. They might need to just blend it a little bit to get it where it needs to be so it's sounding smooth and full again. When you were talking about how you guys start off the workshops with certain foundations, you were saying you start with telling them how exactly 
a pan is made. Would yeah. you be able to share that with our audience? Yeah. So traditionally, it started with a 55-gallon oil drum. They will then take the pen, um, and you can either use a automatic hammer or like a pneumatic hammer which is like electronic mm. and basically you're going to start to hammer it and an oil drum will start flat as we all know and have like a little lip on it as you start to hammer it because the metal is pliable it will start to slowly indent and cave in um, so then once it begins to cave in they will then start to etch out where the notes will be and actually map it because mm. every pen has like a different mapping so once they map out where the notes are, then they start to actually continue to hit it <laughs> so that you can start to get a foundation of what the notes sound like. And then from there, that's when they go in and really fine tune mm. to get the proper sound. They also have to basically put it in a kiln. They have to make it hot. So you have to fire it. Then you have to cool it. And then people also chrome it. Okay. It has to be like sanded as well. So that's why it's heat sensitive. It's, it's a piece of steel. It's a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. So it's heat sensitive because as we know, when heat, when metals heat up, they become pliable. And when metals cool down, they become rigid. So if your mm -hmm. pan is too cold also, which is something we only have a problem with here, um, the pan can crack. So mm -hmm. that's hence why we can't play outside. And it's hard as people to hold sticks when your hands are cold. Mm. So a, a big thing with pen and like the sound and see how you're saying like it captivates you and it hypnotizes you. Part of that is actually the sound waves that you're feeling. 100%. Same way like when you're standing beside a truck, a big truck on the road, you're feeling that, right? When you change the temperature of the ambient temperature changes, yeah. it affects what those vibrations feel like. And that's the other part and too, how it sounds. First of all, when I'm in Grenada, I already feel freaking amazing. So, yeah. but yeah, like the just the atmosphere is what adds to the sweetness of the pan absolutely like, i personally cannot imagine hearing pan in the winter i feel like my brain would kind of <laughs> yeah. like, like it's, it's like, like what's happening what? like, uh, like it doesn't it's not hitting the same <laughs> yeah and i always say to people like because in grenada they play a lot of dance hall throughout the caribbean they play a lot of dance hall when it's not like carnival season right yeah. so i always remember saying like when i hear dance hall in the caribbean on these speakers like it sounds so much better mm -hmm. and it's because of the environment Absolutely. it's literally because of how warm it is like what i'm seeing and the the experience of that music yeah. is so much better than like being here listening to it like in a basement yeah like in a banquet hall whatever in a church basement whatever it, it's 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 the aspect of being outdoors like in the tropics and yeah. having those sound waves hit you and the smell <laughs> the there's smell it's, even it's, is, there's so it's it's yeah. a an experience that is activated by different senses with different simulations that makes mm -hmm. it hypnotic. Absolutely. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until yeah. you said that. So I appreciate that. Cause a lot of times we come on here and we, we learn things together. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's so amazing to kind of hear more about pan, what it takes. Like do yeah. people, are there people here in Toronto who make pan or do you guys get your pans from, from Trinidad or what does that look like? As far as I know, there are a few people here that make pen and there was someone who came up uh, to facilitate making pens in Toronto recently last year. Um, so there are some people, um, but I do know even within my band, there's a couple members who are super interested in going to Trinidad yeah. to learn how to make pen from the ground level and to learn also how to tune and blend it because those crafts are starting to die out, especially up here. We need people to keep up with it. So like for instance, Gus Peter, shout out to you. He tuned our pens last year. Um, so getting people to really getting people who are interested in that craft and getting them the tools and resources they need to facilitate learning and expanding that craft is also, I think, the next step in steel pen growth, because you essentially have an infinite number of musicians. There will always be people that fall in love with steel pen and gravitate towards as a player. The, that's not equally said for people who are interested in making pen or learning to tune it. And I think right now we're kind of finding that it's disproportionate. Mm. Especially and the, in the fear that I have that just came into my mind now is thinking about, because when I was speaking with Jesse, shout out to Jesse. I hope you're listening to this. He was the one who was talking with me on the podcast about Calypso. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he mentioned, he was talking about patents. I don't remember what the patent was for, but he was like, Japan actually owns the patent for so and so and so mm -hmm. something from our culture. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was patent. I don't, I don't remember what it was. Right. Mm -hmm. But he was saying like, you know, he was saying something like basically about how people will capitalize on opportunities that we are not capitalizing on. Yeah. So it's kind of like the fear that I was having when you were saying that is somebody else from another culture or somewhere else coming and be like, well, if you guys don't want to take up learning how to make pan, like we'll do it for you. No problem. 
here's exactly. how much it's going to cost exactly. and we're going to keep that money in our community exactly exactly and and that's the that's the fear not because it's a fear of the other but because it's a fear of losing yeah it's a fear of losing that culture it's a fear of losing that history yeah. and, and how it started and why it started so i think that's definitely important and as much as like we love to shine light on the playing side of Penn, and again, the cultural enrichment, the trade aspect of it, the economic side of it is just as important, valuable. It's just something that we also want to promote as well, because again, this is something like any other niche trade, people who blow glass, people who do ceramics. These are niche trades that we, we are involved in. And again, it's a disproportionate number of people who like ceramics versus who can make ceramics, and steel pen is the same way. Mm. So how do we facilitate more people learning to play pen? Where are we like, how do we invest the resources to get pen making clinics, you know, to obtain the and actually secure the drums that people can use all these little things. And I think once those things are more implemented, not only in Trinidad, but once there is a solid foundation in Trinidad where people can then go there, even if it's not here, that needs to be implemented. Like there needs to be a school, a trade school for learning how to make pen, how to make iron, how to make these rhythm, how to tune Congo, how to how to do this. All of these things are a part of a band. Steel pen and rhythm go hand in hand. So equally, how do, how do we make rhythm? How do we do that? How do we make an iron, right? So. Yeah, I love that. That's a really good point. I've never even considered that this should be taught in school. Like there should be, like this is a trade. This, this is, is a skill. This Just like you would have a blacksmith or a, like it's the, this is a thing that we need to do and to preserve and to value. Um Wow, that's actually really amazing. Um, so did you ever go to Trinidad to receive training or everything that you learned about PAN you learned here in Toronto? Everything I learned was in Toronto. However, I was afforded the extreme privilege of going to Trinidad with PAN Fantasy to play in the international panorama competition uh, to represent Canada in 2015. That is so cool. So that was great. That was amazing. Shouts to you guys again. Uh, that was that was amazing. And for me, it was a full circle moment because yeah. I had grown up going to Trinidad, like to visit family and friends and stuff. And all my pan experiences were in Canada. I'd never played in Trinidad because that's a whole different beast. And shout outs to anyone who plays pan in Trinidad, especially for coming from far in. If you know, you know. Um, so I'd never played in Trinidad. So getting that opportunity was amazing. And it just felt so full circle because I'm used to, you know, playing here used to being in our pan yard, used to our summer vibes, but now going there, having to, firstly, we learned the song here because we performed it at Pan Alive. So that year I played with two bands. I played with New Dimension and I played with Pan Fantasy um, because Miley Duke, the owner of New Dimension Steel Orchestra, rest in peace, he passed away in 2015. So we didn't compete that year. We just did a tribute. So when we went to Trinidad with Pan Fantasy, that was... Listen, we learned most of the song here. We still, you know, did some work on it in Trinidad. And that was like, oh, baby, you want to be a panist? This is real. Mm -hmm. You are in the heat. You are in Kuva in the middle of the day, standing around all this aluminum burning up, getting hot. Because oh my gosh, does the aluminum reflect? The steel reflects. It reflects. Yeah. <laughs> it reflects light. So yeah. the sun shining and beating in the pan. Playing pan in Trinidad is a different beast. Playing pan in the Caribbean, but it, it's, it's a different beast. So... The long practices, the drive from where we were staying in Tunapuna to Kuva, if you know, you know, like <laughs> to go so there. So how long of a drive is that? There was like an hour and a half because of the traffic. But mm. thank you, Kuva Joylanders, for letting you use our pan yard. Much appreciated. Grateful, grateful for that space. It was hot, but it was such an experience because for me, it was, again, so full circle. I'm like, wow, I'm really here in Trinidad playing pan for a panorama. Not the panorama, but a panorama. So as much as some things were difficult... I didn't complain. I had to essentially even relearn the song because the guitar I was playing on was shifted in Trinidad. So I had to relearn it because the notes weren't in the same spot as when I learned it. That is also something that happens. Not all pans are mapped in place the same way per se. So some notes maybe shifted a couple inches right or left or kind of flipped. So I had to relearn the song down there in the week that we were there to perform it. My pan fell off on stage and um, I picked it back up while I was playing and able to finish the song. And only some people saw and they were like, wow. But in one of the videos, you can kind of see because the rack we're playing on, segueing into when we're actually performing yeah. at International Panorama. Firstly, being on the drag was amazing. So being on the drag is when you're practicing in the savannah, just kind of in the park, but not on the performance stage. And that's a vibe because we got to see all the other international bands from countries that were represented. We got to see Japan, Jamaica, 
England, USA, Sweden, different countries, they're practicing on the drag, we're all getting ready. And then when you actually go on the stage, the stage itself is buoyant. So when you're on the rack, it's, it's jumping. Okay. So your pens have metal hooks that attach from like a plastic wire on your actual pen into the stand. Mm -hmm. Gravity. Mm. <laughs> so the rack is bumping and my pens flew up and came off. Girl, I picked up those pens so yeah. quick. I picked up those pens so never quick moved and so kept fast going. in your life. Never, never shroops, shroops, and kept going. And all of that was it's adrenaline. So memorable, yeah. Like that made it. That little bit of spice mm -hmm. added a little something mm -hmm. to my experience. And a story to honestly, tell. You know what I mean? And the props that I got from my family and friends are like, I'm going to tell your parents when we get back home because mm. you, know, you did that. It was so amazing, and it just. Again, it was it was so full circle for me, too. And I know it really made my dad proud, like him seeing me yeah. play in Trinidad. So that was amazing. And then I was there with my boyfriend. So that was also great. Yeah. Shout out to you, Tadell. So that was that was amazing, too. And also with Pen Fantasy, shout out to you guys. I was able to go to New York and, and participate in New York Panorama in 2016. So much fun. So much fun. New York Panorama is so different. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. And it's... It's been so nice now having played Penn in three different competitions in three different places and seeing what's different about it and also what's yeah. the same. The passion is the same. The diversity, the diversity, the proportions may be different, but every place we've played Penn has been diverse. And that's something that like our band, I think, really embodies, but also want to spread to people like Penn is diverse, as is the Caribbean. Trinidad is a very diverse country and Trinidad is the birthplace of steel Penn. So you see that reflected in the bands as well. You have people from all races, all nationalities, and it's it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I right. remember seeing that in your your band when I was seeing different people from different backgrounds playing pan with the same passion. Same like passion. you're saying. And it's yeah. and again, I have the same experience where it's like I want to get closer and closer to the band. Like I want to yeah. be right there. <laughs> Girl, listen, if you ever want to come to the pan yard, you or anyone, we are always open to people coming and being in this space because yeah. you really, it, it's important for the community to know there's a safe space. Like if you're having a bad day, you're not feeling well, maybe you just want something to pick you up or you just want to feel connected to your roots or something. Maybe you've lost a loved one and you want to connect with them in some way. Pen is a beautiful way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Just by even sitting, you don't even have to participate, mm -hmm. you know? So we definitely encourage that. It's, it's amazing highly recommend 10 out of 10 highly recommend you guys should do it pull up to the pan yard you will not be disappointed it's a vibe yeah and so where can where can people find you guys online like let's say maybe somebody mm. wants to learn more about playing pan like okay well what if i want lessons like is that yeah. something that you guys offer or what does that look like yeah absolutely so we do offer lessons and our website is coming soon it's now in the process uh people like when i talk in my newscaster voice it's so, great so this it's is a it. great voice new dimension steel orchestra.com coming soon to a website near you yes we do it all we do workshops we do lessons corporate events private gigs weddings book us we do it all Feel free to come by our pan yard. We are located in the North York area at York Mills in Leslie, technically off Scarsdale Road, underneath the bridge beside LCBO. There's an LCBO nearby. Need I say less? So that's where they can find us. <laughs> We're on Instagram at New Dimension Steel Orchestra with underscores in between. Not to be confused with New Dimension Steel Orchestra out of Grenada. So there's actually a New Dimension Steel Orchestra in Grenada. Shout outs to them just so you know we're from toronto you guys already know what it is so <laughs> and where can people find you if they want to connect with you if you would like to connect with me my name is aldine you can find me on instagram at aldine.h i'm our marketing director our player number one cheerleader and enthusiast for new dimension seal orchestra and i'm a lover of all things caribbean culture and mass shout out to tribal carnival thank you so much for being here thank you so much for having me kiana this, really this is amazing fun, yeah. i just want to big kiana up and make sure you guys support and blood podcast it's amazing how she's using this platform to share, educate, and spread knowledge about the Caribbean diaspora throughout. So make sure you guys bigger up, young lady doing her thing. It takes a lot of courage to do this. So thank you so much for having me and creating this space. Like we, we really you. needed this. So thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so honored. Steel <laughs> pan, guys. <laughs>